Hello, everybody. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to the second Talk Death event presented by Keeper. Thank you all for watching either live or later on. <laughs> <laughs> So after the really positive responses that we received from our first event featuring Caitlin Doty and uh, Lauren Leroy, we've decided to make this a regular event, which is really exciting. Yeah. Um, our two panelists that we have with us today come from different backgrounds and approaches to death and dying, and we're really excited to have them here to bring their unique perspectives to our discussion. Uh, so we're going to start by quickly going over the goal of the series. And uh, we'll introduce our panelists, and then we'll get right to your questions. And uh, just to quickly introduce myself, my name is Georgia Carter, and I am a graduate student at uh, Concordia University in Montreal, Canada, in Religious Studies. And my name is Mandy. I am the founder of Keeper. For those of you who don't know, Keeper is an online social memorial platform where essentially families can log on to our website, they can create a free, beautiful memorial for someone who's passed away so that they can share all the videos and photos and memories of someone. And we're actually coming out with a really wonderful new application that's being tested, which will give you instant directions to any monument in a cemetery, and will also allow you to discover all the lives of people within the cemetery by simply taking a photo of the monument with your phone. So we're really excited for that, and make sure to keep updated with Keeper. Um, so what is Talk Death, and why are we doing this? Basically, we decided to build this Talk Death Roundtable discussion on the principle of death positivity and death awareness. So essentially, um, we realized, working with Keeper, that death is super taboo in the West and in other parts of the world, but we're going to talk about the West right now, essentially. And people just are really uncomfortable talking about something that we're all going to go through at one point in our lives, right? Um, so really it's for anyone who's curious about what happens in an embalming room or what your options are if you don't want a traditional funeral or if you're dealing with a loss and you're not really sure where else to turn to. We wanted to provide a platform where professionals who work in this every day can talk openly to you, the public, about all your questions. So um, we've been collecting all of your questions and they're wonderful. They've been super awesome and totally different from the last talk yet, so we're really excited about that. And for those of you who are tuning in now and you have not had the chance to ask your question, go on Twitter, hashtag talk death with your question, and we have someone who will be sending it over to us. And if we have time, we'll totally ask. All right. Without further ado, we will introduce our panelists now. Um, and we're going to start with Chris Raymond. Hello, Chris. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me today. I appreciate it. We're really happy to have yeah. you. Um, so, Chris, uh, since 2002, Chris Raymond has uh, served as about.com's expert. Or, sorry, 2012. <laughs> 2012 uh, has served as about.com's expert on dying, funerals, and grief. Previously, he served as the editor for the Director Magazine, uh, which is the official monthly publication of the National Funeral Directors Association and the world's most widely read magazine for funeral directors, embalmers, and other death care professionals. Uh, Chris has spoken on numerous death and dying topics to audiences of funeral service professionals and the public alike. And um, his articles have appeared in leading funeral service publications all over the world. So we're really happy to have yeah. you here, Chris. Thank you. Uh, and uh, our second uh, panelist is Gail Rubin. Hi, Gail. Hi, Gail. <laughs> Hi guys. Great to be with you. <laughs> um, so, Gail, the doyen of death, <laughs> is the host of the award-winning TV and DVD series, A Good Goodbye, as well as the author of A Good Goodbye, Funeral Planning for Those Who Don't Plan to Die. Uh, a certified thanatologist, or death educator, Gail uses her humor to attract people to death-related death topics that uh, many would rather avoid speaking about. Uh, she is a member of the Association for Death Education and Counseling and the International Cemetery Cremation and Funeral Association. 
and she is also the 2015 president of the Jewish Christian Dialogue of New Mexico, which helps start uh, conversations across religions, which is really interesting. Yeah, super amazing panelists with so much yeah. experience. <laughs> so thank you both for being here with us today. Um, and we are so excited for you guys to answer everyone's questions. Um, before we get started on the serious questions, let's do, uh, we did a little digging. Um, so the first bit of digging we did uh, was related to Chris, and it was very respectful digging. It was just the internet. You know, that's um, a funny word to use when you're talking about death and dying. By the way. <laughs> oh, gosh. Go on. <laughs> this is going to come up a lot, isn't it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we noticed that, Chris, before your, uh, sorry, following your editing position as the director, you were the editor of the Astronomy Magazine. And Managing editor, yes. That's, A, that's super cool. I'm a total astronomy fan. Um, mm. So tell us, what's like the coolest astronomy fact you learned while working there? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, you know, astronomy is such a big topic because uh, uh, it's a universal. Um, just, I think the thing that gets me, it's not necessarily a fact, but it's just the scale of the universe. As human beings, we have absolutely no ability to relate to that. You know, if the if the sun was a basketball, you know, the, the Earth would be like a golf ball miles and miles away. Um, it's just the scale of it. Awesome. Yeah, that makes us feel very small. Thank yeah, you. Totally. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, okay, Gail, seeing as you're all about humor. Can you tell us either one super overused death pun or an actually funny death joke? Well, of course, whenever you talk about funerals, they're dying to get in to the cemetery. But there is a joke, actually, I heard. Actually, it was a real-life situation when I was attending a funeral director's convention. One elderly funeral director met up with another one, and he said, hey, it's good to see you. And the other one said, it's good to be seen. It's better than being viewed. <laughs> oh, <boy. laughs> <laughs> humor, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Cal. That was perfect. Okay, let's get to the real questions. Um, <laughs> sorry for wasting everybody's time already. Um, <laughs> All right, so the first question is by at Megan Mooney MSW from Twitter. Her question is, what do you perceive to be the worst end-of-life problem right now? Hmm. Are you Chris, it's on you. <laughs> <laughs> well, in my mind, um, the worst problem is that death is inevitable. Humans have a 100% mortality rate, and people aren't talking about end-of-life issues because they're so nervous about the topic. And when you don't talk about what's going to happen to your body when you die, you leave your relatives, your loved ones, in a heap of trouble wondering what to do, what would you have wanted, and where is all the information we need. So I think that's the most pressing problem that we face today in regard to not funeral planning. I completely concur. But I mean, but there are a multitude of end-of-life problems or challenges, issues, um, in addition to the fact that people live in disbelief that they're actually going to die. They're aware that that's out there, but that's something that happens to other people, generally. Um, you know, you have a growing situation with uh, men and women that are caring for elderly parents, their home caregivers, which creates a great deal of stress um, because of the issues that involves, you know, they're also trying to raise their own family and, and all the other things we take care of in life, as well as this second full-time job, basically. Um, there's, you know, the whole issue of di death with dignity, assisted dying. Um, should we enable that, make it, you know, uh, more commonplace or not? I mean, these are huge issues, of course. Um, from my perspective, I agree with Gail that uh, the challenge I face in my role is how do I get people who don't want to talk about death 
to have a single conversation so that when they do die, you know, their immediate spouse, partner, family member, child, whatever, at least has some inkling of how they want their services and disposition to be performed. There's a number of issues. And for our viewers who, you know, might not be familiar with this end of life type term, you know, it really has to do with with you know, a whole bracket of things like you all discussed. So it's from when you become elderly, it's about hospice care. It's it's also funeral arrangements. There's it's really um, a whole slew um, of you know that's what end of life. It, it's like a very large bracket. Um, so it, there's so many topics within it, really. Um, just to to clear that up. Um, okay, well let's get to the second one. This is by the funeral commander. Hi, we've met him before. He's awesome. Um, hey, Jeff. Hello, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is the most common mistake a consumer makes when choosing a funeral home or making funeral arrangements? Well, I'll jump in here. Oh, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Gail. Um, the number one challenge or, or well, that's really a two-part question, I think. The number one mistake I think consumers make is how they select the funeral home. Um, the National Funeral Directors Association since 1990 has conducted a survey of consumer attitudes about and, and behaviors about funeral arrangements and so on. And one of the questions they've repeatedly asked is, why did you select a particular funeral home? And since 1990, the number one reason is location. So people are selecting a funeral home purely on the fact that it's down the street or across town or they pass it every day when they commute back and forth from work. Now this doesn't necessarily mean that's a bad thing, but if you're choosing a funeral home just because that's the one that comes to mind, you don't have any idea if it's the most expensive funeral service uh, or funeral home in town, if it maybe doesn't offer the type of goods or services that you, know, you would want when you're making arrangements that you would find personal and meaningful. Um, so I strongly encourage people to do your homework. It's incredibly easy these days to compare uh, funeral homes and, and cremation providers and so on. And funeral homes are required by law to have a general price list, which is a kind of standardized form that lists uh, apples to apples uh, pricing for specific goods and services they offer. So go online, access these things, download them, print them out, and do some comparison shopping. At the end of the day, you may very well choose the funeral home that's down the street or across town or the one you pass every day to and from work, but at least you're making an informed decision, and that's the first step in creating a personal, meaningful service. And so you're saying that, um, do you find that a lot of funeral homes are actually being honest and showing their prices and, and allowing people to do this comparison shopping? Because we found sometimes the opposite, where funeral homes, sometimes they won't give the pricing up front and honestly. Well, the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, um, all funeral homes, all, let me be very specific, all providers of funeral services and goods, that and is important here, funeral providers of goods and services are required by the Federal Trade Commission to provide a general price list or GPL. Now, they are not required to post it online. They are not required to mail it to you if you call on the phone. But if you go to a funeral home personally and ask or, and begin a discussion that involves prices of specific goods, a funeral home must, by law, hand you a copy of that GPL immediately. It's, it is for you to keep, to take with you. In other words, they can't just show you uh, you know, a plastic binder that has their general price list in it, it must be given to you to keep. And if they don't do that, if they fail to do that, they're in violation of the Federal uh, Trade Commission funeral rule, and they can get into some serious issues. Now, I don't know, Mandy, if you were referring to funeral homes not posting their GPL online. That they don't have to do. I found in my experience that a lot of the leading funeral homes, they do it because they realize that this is a way, to, a portal, if you will, that consumers are reaching them. Yeah, I feel like that's starting to become more of a trend with mm -hmm. online shopping and just Googling everything being just second nature now. And I feel like some funeral homes are, are starting to do that more, and I think it's benefiting them 
more than anything. Uh, yeah. Gail, what's your take on this? It is absolutely a huge consumer issue to shop around before you have a dead body on your hands. When you're already under duress of grief, all of your uh, processing in your brain is affected by what's going on in your heart. And when you're grieving, you're going to make decisions that don't make sense. They're influenced by guilt or you know, over overspending can happen because, oh my God, I feel guilty. The way I like to put it is, if your car died, you wouldn't run right out and buy the first car at the first lot you came to. Chances are you do a little research, shop around online, um, think about what you want in your next car, and actually make some informed decisions. So. That's why it's important to actually go around and visit funeral homes in your neighborhood, in your town, and shop around for different personalities, different facilities, as well as the price. Yeah. And not necessarily the cheapest provider is the person you might want to, you know, might or might not want to go with. Because I have heard horror stories about well, we went with the cheapest provider, but our experience was not very good. So knowing these things before you have to have a funeral is really a consumer savvy way to go, is shop around. And it's a fascinating shopping trip. Uh, it really is. I helped a friend of mine who wanted to prearrange a direct cremation. His name's Gary. And Gary and I went to a couple of different places. And in, in one high end funeral home, which was $850 more expensive for a direct cremation than the provider he went with, we were sitting in their arrangement room and talking with the, the prearrangement lady joking about all the great things you can do with cremated remains. And then somebody in the lobby came and closed the door to the lobby because there was a brief family sitting out there waiting to come in and make arrangements for somebody who had already died. Mm -hmm. So when you are there making arrangements before somebody dies, you can laugh in the face of death. And it's a much more pleasant experience. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, it's interesting. We actually just got a message uh, on Twitter uh, by, by Gareth Nelson who said, people tend not to make rational choices when under severe emotional distress. So that really speaks to what you just said. And, you know, and that even goes back to the first question is, you know, you said probably the, one of the worst problems is that people don't want to talk about death and dying until it actually happens. So both of those questions are related to just pre-planning really and just thinking about it beforehand. Yeah, because in the moment, obviously, when you're under all these this situation of stress, you just want to get it over with. So you might make yeah. a decision that you'll later regret. Yeah. You know? Well, that's exactly not, right. You might not have the experience. Situation, when somebody has died, you know, you immediately have not only the overwhelming nature of losing a loved one, which is making you, th you're not thinking clearly, you're truly not, even if you think you are. Um, but you're not only dealing with that, but in an Adney situation, when, the, when you have, as you said, a body on your hands, if you will, um, you are in a very compressed time frame making significant decisions that impact you or, or your loved ones financially. Um, and this is a legal financial situation that you're doing so you definitely don't want to do that what's crazy about it put it in a slightly different context is think about the last time you may have purchased a new vehicle or planned a vacation or even a career move or moving to a new uh, home or apartment you probably did a significant amount of research and yet m the majority of people never have a single conversation about it they never they don't even know what funeral home they went call, except as I mentioned, the, probably the local one, um, until somebody has died. Um, so we, we obviously find it more important to plan for that new vacation, that new vehicle, that new job or whatever, and yet when it comes to selecting a provider, we are going to entrust the body of, of someone that we love dearly, we don't do any preparation, and I just think that's crazy. Yeah, totally. I mean, you know, for the person 
who is passing away, they're probably like, well, won't be my problem anymore. <laughs> I hear that a lot. <laughs> right? That a lot. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a life cycle event, just like a wedding. And yeah. there are so many similar elements. And yet if brides and grooms plan their weddings the way most people plan their funerals, they'd be scrambling to pull everything together in three to five days. Yeah. Talk about stress. Yeah, absolutely. Let's move on, oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so our next question is from um, from Twitter. I'm not sure how I'm to say sure that either. I'm not sure how to say this. <laughs> uh, Senor Tulu. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, something to that effect. Either way. <laughs> um, but the question is, uh, what do the panelists think about death and religion? Does faith complicate things or make it easier to deal with? Very interesting question. Well, I'm a certified funeral celebrant, and the celebrant movement is growing in the United States because we have a growing number of people who call themselves nuns, N-O-N-E-S. They have no religion. And what I see is that when you've got a religious tradition, you actually may or may not know the rituals that, that, that your religion follows, but very often the family, even if they're not particularly religious, will go to a clergy person uh, or look to a clergy person to provide some kind of ritual that makes sense. But if you don't have any kind of religious tradition, then what are you going to do? You need to find a way to process your grief with free-form ritual. And uh, I think that's a growing problem in this day and age. But even, I'm, I'm Jewish, and growing up Jewish, we didn't get taught about Jewish general traditions. And I had to learn it as I became an adult. Um, so again, it's the topic that people don't want to talk about, and it even applies in religious tradition situations. Yeah, and, and this question is a, it's a profound and a big question, um, but it all depends on your perspective. I mean, I'm not religious by nature, but I respect people of faith and what their, their beliefs are, and so if you want to take the perspective in terms of the question, is this referring to, is it a comfort or a hindrance to that individual, um, if their religion and their faith and their beliefs give them um, some sense of assurance or you know, gives them meaning to why they're here on earth and, and the potential of an afterlife and so on, if they find that comforting and it helps them cope with the reality of death, then it's a great thing. Um, in terms of possibly being a hindrance, we're seeing this right now in funeral service. Um, as Gail mentioned, the nuns, the people that are no longer identify themselves with a particular organized religion, that's increasing and it's, it's growing quite a bit. Um, and so what they're doing is it's challenging sort of the status quo of funeral, the traditional funeral in the United States, which has traditionally been, uh, you know, a, a casketed earth burial that's preceded by a somewhat religious or all religious service in a church or even a funeral home chapel. And many people now, because they're not finding value in that or they don't consider themselves religious, are sort of, as Gail alluded to, struggling to, okay, well, if I don't want a church general, if I don't want a quasi-religious funeral in a funeral home chapel or, or administered by a chaplain or, or a priest or whomever, what options do I have? And so consumers and funeral providers, I think, are experiencing, one of them is what's happening to the type of funeral we've been offering, and another is seeking alternatives, and, and gradually we're making our way through this. Yeah, and that was a really big topic during our last talk, Death, with uh, Caitlin and Lauren, and it was really talking about a movement of trying to create new non-secular, like, well, secular rituals, essentially, because that's it, is really, the reality is, um, you know, our generation is becoming less and less uh, religious, and they're looking less towards the church or the synagogue or uh, whatever their, their faith may be, and, but at the end of the day, they're, you know, there is almost a, re there is a reason why we have these types of rituals. You know, like you mentioned, the Jewish ritual, sitting Shiva. You know, we had a friend who passed away, and all of our friends ended up just staying in the same house for a week. And 
it was literally, they were literally sitting Shiva, even though no one was Jewish. And it was just trying to come up with our own rituals and our own ways to cope now in this, in this modern day and age, essentially. Right. In fact, the New, York, the New York Times did a story a couple of years ago exactly about that, secular Shivas, where it's that time spent together with a supportive community. And it's very healing. Um, and it's one of the major differences between Christian and Jewish traditions and funerals is that you get the support of your community in a Christian setting at the wake and the visitations leading up to the funeral. And then in a Jewish funeral tradition, you bury quickly, and then you spend that time with the family afterwards, sitting with them, processing the grief that way. Yeah. And this is a great example of how um, I mentioned how our ritual, as you mentioned too, uh, Mandy, our rituals and traditions and practices are changing um, in response to the fact that people are identifying themselves as frequently religious. You know, uh, funeral providers across the country are hiring on staff or at least having on standby um, certified staff secular people, uh, individuals that are respected in the community who can lead a funeral service that is not religious. Um, but it gets back to, again, what we're talking about, why it's important to plan ahead. Because when a death occurs, if you don't particularly want a religious service, if you haven't looked into it and you just go to the local funeral home, they don't have a celebrant available or know even what the hell you're talking about, you may very well end up having a traditional religious service, even though it's not what you were the least wanted. Yeah. Okay, I think we should... Oh, yeah. yeah let's, halfway there. let's go to the next one. Thank you, guys. That was awesome. Yeah. Um, okay, so also from Twitter, uh, this is the right mindset <laughs> asked, what role does public education have in teaching children about death and dying? Not much. <laughs> Not I was going to say, this what, is going to be a short answer. Yeah, or what yeah, we, let's move on. <laughs> I, no, I wish they did talk about it more. I know I've um, been a guest speaker at death and dying classes at the college level, but, you know, within 12, K through 12, you know, if your pet died, that's probably the most education you'll get about death and dying. And, and your emotional response to it. And really, it comes down to how your parents deal with it, mm. but not within the um, public school system. I, I don't think you'll get much, unless biology teachers are up for that. <laughs> now, I remember reading a survey, I think it was published in the early 90s, of, that examined death education across all grade levels in the United States. And if I remember correctly, I think in high school, High schools offered the most, but it was only 20% of high schools in the country. That's one in five. And, you know, college level or, or lower grades was even a lower amount. Now, that was in the early 90s. I'm guessing because of the way our educational system has transitioned from being one of teaching people to think, or students to think critically and logically to more of a vocational education. My guess is that the, the number of schools offering any form of death education has is, is declined significantly. And that's a real problem because there is this huge potential here, I believe, um, if we offered, like, I would, I'm in favor of a high school level mandatory semester that focuses on death education. It shouldn't get into whether or not there's an afterlife and, and, and various, you know, theoretical concepts. It can be vocational in nature. But let's start introducing students to, one, the reality of that people die. Here's how to plan a will or create a will. Here's how to create an advanced health care directive, a, a DNR, do not resuscitate. Um, here's what happens when you arrange a funeral. Uh, here are some of the realities you're going to have to face if you're settling somebody's estate. Not because we anticipate that these students in five or ten years are going to use those, but I remember I was required in grade school to take home economics. And, and that single semester where I learned to read a recipe and measure and use a knife safely without cutting off a digit, um, that's probably one of the most beneficial courses I've taken over the course of my life because, you know, I'm not an idiot in the kitchen. And at least this way we can give students some familiarity, take the fear out of it so that when the situation arises, they go, oh, yeah, I remember this. 
Yeah. yeah, totally. And I feel like that's so almost so the case in like in high school in general. Like we no longer get like we were never taught home ec. I don't know if you were. Like we no. we don't even <laughs> learn how to bake a cake. Um, you know, let alone you know learn about end of life. And I think yeah. you know it's there's something to also be said. Um, you know, of course, on the parents' part because there's so many things that unfortunately the education system um, cannot cover and you know one of them is there is some pretty interesting books out there that parents can buy that introduce children to the concept of death and I think even starting with with those types of stories are super interesting and there's also a lot of parents who will actually buy their children's pets to start teaching them about what it's like to, to deal with a loss and, and what that's like when something passes away and you know and when your rabbit dies it didn't just go up to the country like no it, it died <laughs> 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 you know? um, yeah. we're actually gonna do a oh, video yeah. question right something now different. <laughs> so something different we're gonna totally change subjects this one is from Lucy do you wanna Lucy? Yes. Where is she from? She is from Melbourne, Australia. Okay. Uh, yeah, she did a little video for us. Okay, so let's share that. I'm going to present it. Can everyone see that right now? Everyone sees Lucy? All right, let's ask her question. Is it common for people to be buried with objects that have been important throughout their life? Yep. Okay. Did we all hear that, or was yeah. that difficult to hear? Being buried with objects in the casket? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I she wants to know if pe people ask to be buried with certain objects. Yeah, personal objects. All the time. Yes. Yeah? <laughs> Name us a few. Or yeah. So something like interesting. Kind of yeah. Well, I've, mm -hmm. I've seen people want to be buried with their cell phones, just in case. <laughs> They wake up and want to make a call. <laughs> oh my goodness! You know the, the modern equivalent of uh, the uh, string going down to the casket attached to a bell. So you know, in case they wake up underground, they can get out. I don't know if you can get a cell phone signal six feet under, though. <laughs> I have never heard that before. That's oh wow. yeah. I mean, this is not at all uncommon, and I mean, I would almost venture to say it's routine now. I mean, and it can range from very simple items such as a family making sure that mom is wearing her wedding ring or a particular necklace to, you know, let's make sure grandpa's buried in that blue suit that really made his eyes pop. It can be something that simple and significant. Um, uh, Batesville, one of the largest can casket manufacturers, actually has a, I believe it's patented or, or trademarked at least, a um, a, what they call a memory drawer, which is a little tiny drawer that's built into the uh, uh, in a split couch or half couch casket, the typical one. It's a little drawer in that part that doesn't open where family members can place small mementos or a, a letter or something significant that's actually buried. Hmm. Now those are the simple uh, things, but to answer Lucy's question, which by the way that's a great way to submit that, I appreciate that, um, the sky's the limit. Uh, Frank Sinatra, the famous singer, was buried with a bottle of Jack Daniels in his cask because that was his favorite booze. Um, George Burns, who lived to be 100 despite smoking multiple cigars most of the days of his life, was buried with three cigars in his, in his jacket pocket. Um, but the craziest one I've ever heard, or there's two of them actually, but the one that comes to mind is there was a... Um, a young widow of a millionaire who died relatively young herself in her late 30s, I think. She wanted to be buried not only wearing a nightgown, but seated in the driver's seat of her 1964 sky blue Ferrari convertible. And so she was literally buried in the driver's seat. And right now, whatever remains of her is seated behind that uh, that incredible car. And to me, it's an unfortunate waste of a great car, but that's what she wanted. <laughs> <laughs> I actually heard on the news that, and this was an issue that happened this year, there was a woman, her wishes were to euthanize her dog and be buried with her dog. Yes. You, this is actually... What happened I, with that, actually? I've been reading about this as well. This is actually kind of a... I don't want to call it a trend, but it's on the rise. Um, because states generally classify pets as property and owners have the right to dispose of property as they see fit, there are a growing number of people that are actually writing into their wills that when I die, I want my pet, my dog, my cat, whatever, uh, put down, euthanized, 
um, and buried with me or cremated with me. Um, it's most generally legal, but it certainly raises huge moral and ethical questions. Totally. Absolutely. I think we'll leave that one there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, this one's from Longevity Letter. What alternatives are there to burial and cremation? How does one donate their body to science or anything like that? Let me jump on the donating your body to science question. One thing that you need to know about donating your body to science, it's a great way to get a free cremation. <laughs> However, you do need to um, make your arrangements either with a medical school or a national donation service ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So that means you have to have mental capacity, uh, be an adult, so over the age of 18, and also there's no upper age limit, which is nice. However, if you have certain infectious diseases, you will be ruled out as a whole body donor. And the, those include hepatitis, tuberculosis, HIV, AIDS. Um, I'm not sure if there's any others I'm missing at the moment. But uh, also, if your body is, um, if you're ser seriously overweight or underweight, and also if there's edema, swelling, uh, fluid retention, uh, or trauma to the body. They, they basically, for a medical school, they want a whole body that students could dissect and study. For national donation services, any, any number of uses, including surgery training, better to train surgeons on dead people than live people. Uh, for experimenting with new medical hip, knee, joint replacements, all these other things. And it's, it's a wonderful way of helping society as well as getting a free cremation because with the national donation services, they'll take the body and do whatever they do and then return the cremated remains to the family within two, three, up to 12 weeks. Now if you donate to a medical school, they might hold on to that body for up to two years. Yeah. So if the family is eager to get the cremated remains back, that may not be the way to go. And you also need to have a plan B. Uh, in case your local medical school has all the cadavers they need, because they can turn down the donation of the body at any time if you happen to die when they're full up. So you, that's why I say these national services are a great option for a plan B in case something like that happens. And we just had that here in New Mexico last year. Uh, uh, a man who had cancer was really looking forward to donating his body to the medical school, but they were full up when he died and his widow had to uh, wind up spending the money to have them cremated, and that was a hardship for her. But these national services uh, named MedCure, um, Life Legacy, Science Care, uh, those three are accredited by the Association for uh, Tissue Banks. So you definitely want to look for an accredited service. So what's the best way for people to sort of get all this information? Uh, would they just like a simple Google search, or is there sort of one resource that that's really great for, for viewers to, to check out? Online, an online search will yield all those providers. You definitely want to look for accredited. And then also, you know, check with your local university if they have a medical school. Chris, is there anything you wanted to add to that? Well, I would just add that uh, organ donation, and in one of life's cruel ironies where we can't get enough uh, or organs and tissue donated, um, organ and tissue donation can affect the willingness of an institution or organization to accept the body because, as Gail said, they want whole bodies. I think I've read that eye donations are generally acceptable, but, again, as she's saying, you need to do your homework in advance. Um, because time is of the essence once an individual dies. And, and that's also, uh, it, it's generally it's local or very regional. Uh, you shouldn't expect to die in Wisconsin and, 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 and have uh, a donation made to some institution in California. So we basically need to pick between organ donation or donating to science, essentially. 
Correct. If you're in a car accident and you've marked on your driver license that you want to donate your organs, um, they will take your organs. Well, your family member has to okay the removal of your organs. And then if you wanted to donate to science, you couldn't because your body is no longer whole. Okay. And as, as altruistic as it is to donate your organs, it, it doesn't get you a free cremation. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, huh, that was super informative, actually. Yeah. Great. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I hope that wasn't too gory for our viewers, but this is what this is all about. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, if you can okay. address the second, or the, I guess the first part of that que question, which I think yes. was, um, are there alternatives to burial and cremation? Yes. Um, yes, there are. Um, in the United States, at least, you're going to have trouble finding these other alternatives because burial and cremation are the two primary forms. And I want to emphasize something, that that's, that's a form of final body disposition. When somebody dies, we have to do something with the remains. But burial, whether below ground or above, or cremation, that's not the funeral. You can cremate a body and still hold an entire funeral service beforehand. You can bury a body and hold a memorial service afterwards. So one is not necessarily exclusive. But as far as alternative disposition options, um, probably the uh, one that is <laughs> on the horizon, let's say, is called alkaline hydrolysis. This is also known as flameless cremation or cremation without fire. Um, it involves basically a specially uh, crafted chamber in which the body is placed. It uses relatively low temperatures, so somewhere around 170 degrees, um, and pressure, and it reduces the, the, the cadaver to a liquid. Now, anytime you see a reference or a story about this in, the, in mainstream journalism, they're going to refer to it as a goo, and nobody likes the thought of their body being changed into goo, so that's one of the hurdles that this is uh, this form of disposition is facing. Um, there's also another uh, form of disposition that's still rather theoretical called promethean, and essentially to euphemize it, it's sort of freeze-drying a body. Um, it uses mechanical vibration and, and temperature to reduce a human body to a powder. Um, again, that was developed in Sweden quite a while ago, uh, to my knowledge, it's still not available as an actual, you know, consumer available form of disposition anywhere. No, sorry. What are the like? What are the advantages of those two alternatives to just regular cremation? Is it like more environmentally friendly, or? Yes, the primary. I mean, that's the advantage that uh, alkaline hydrolysis and and promethean offer or, or promise, I should say, um, you know, cremation is often seen as a more environmentally friendly form of disposition than burial because you're not putting embalming chemicals and other, you know, uh, lacquers and, 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 and so on, glues into the earth where it can leak into the water system and so on. Cremation still uses uh, a great deal of energy to cremate a body and it can release toxins into the air. Uh, such as mercury and other types of emissions, if not carefully or properly done. Natural burial is even more environmentally friendly if you really want to reduce your carbon footprint. Um, but alkaline hydrolysis sort of offers that same promise, that, uh, yeah. again, a really low energy type of disposition. And I've heard it. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say I've heard that it uses about a tenth of the energy that a typical average flame-based cremation uses. In fact, when I go out and give talks and I talk about cremation, I, I have solar panels on my house here in sunny New Mexico, and it's a 4.5 kilowatt system. And it tells me how much CO2 I'm offsetting by generating electricity from the sun. And an average cremation for an average sized person generates about 532 pounds of CO2. And I would have to run my solar panels here in sunny New Mexico for 14 days to offset one cremation. Wow. <laughs> and in less sunnier climates, like maybe Wisconsin, uh, you're talking about maybe up to a month. So it, it does have a carbon footprint. Yeah. And I think uh, there's also been the talk with alkaline hydrolysis that people have been calling it basically like cremation by, like in a warm bath. 
So it's like you can be cremated in a warm bath or in flames. And so people are starting to like the idea of alkaline hydrolysis more. However, there's the issue where I think it's only legal in what three states now, I think. And I, I believe think that's it's correct. I think it's legal in, in Quebec where we are, but I'm not sure about the rest of Canada. So I think I mean personally I feel like that's something that's definitely gonna start taking off um, more and more. Um, and uh, apparently you can even with alkaline hydrolysis after um, the body's decomposed, apparently the liquid that comes out of it is is so clean that it can just go right down the drain. So that's, that's really correct. interesting. Right. It's sterile and it's great fertilizer. Mm -hmm. There you go. Oh yeah, that's another thing now is, is human composting that's been coming up. But uh, we should probably actually move on because we're going to be running out of time. We could talk about this stuff forever. Um, let's, you want to ask that one? Yeah, sure. Okay, so this one we got off of Facebook actually uh, from Gloria Eve. And the question is, are guests ever invited to interact with the physical body of the deceased at a funeral? Mm. So we want to, you know, we, we're, we're planning a service and, and we want to actually, like well, let's say someone wants to witness the body being washed or wants to even assist yeah. on the body being washed. Because that's something that we're seeing more now with home funerals starting to come up. If we want to do that, are we, are we able to? Yeah. Yes, I think most funeral directors would accommodate whatever request the family makes. I'm a member of the Heber Kedisha, the Jewish Burial Society, and we have teams of men for men and women for women who actually go back in, in the back rooms at the funeral home to wash the body, dress it in white linen or cotton clothing, and place it in the casket in a ritual manner. I can tell you only of one time out of the many times that I've done this that anybody from the family actually wanted to be there to participate. I, I think if people ask to do it, they could. They just don't know to ask to do it. That's and exactly it is, right. And it's a very healing uh, activity yeah. to actually encounter the dead. It's something we've gotten out of touch with in our modern society. Yeah, and that's something that uh, Caitlin talked about a lot was she was working with families who wanted, teaching them how to care for a body at home and how to wash a body. And, you know, people, you know, there's the, the discussion about how it's scarring and how it's a very intense experience. Um, but she writes this even in her book, um, that out of all the families that she's done that with, with no one has ever come to her with any sense of regret of, of actually being a part of that service. And if anything, it, it helped them with the process and it made them feel like they were really a part of it. So, yeah, that's just something for everyone to note out there that it's possible. Oh, yeah, and, and it goes beyond, you know, uh, washing the body or dressing the body, but you, it's exactly right. You need to ask the funeral director or ask your funeral provider, can I do these things? Um, another thing that is starting to grow in terms of a trend, I guess, is uh, families attending the actual cremation. Cremation is on the rise as a form of disposition, and generally, in the past, it's say goodbye to your loved one, and then we're going to whisk them behind the magic curtain and take care of it, and then you'll receive an urn with cremated remains. But uh, many funeral providers or cremation providers, too, are, are starting to you know, to kind of take it out of the industrial, grungy warehouse type of thing and incorporate areas where families can either watch the cremation process of the retort itself, and in some cases they press the button that literally begins the process, and that can prove very cathartic as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's talk, let's ask Jeremy's question, actually. Yeah, so we're about 10 minutes up, so this, I think, is a good uh, concluding question. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. okay, so this is from Jeremy. Um, who, who's <laughs> our, also one of our communications directors who cannot be here today, yeah. but he sends his regards and his this questions. Question. <laughs> um, so as deaf communicators, what are some of your biggest challenges? <laughs> Challenging, I, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take from that laugh. <laughs> 
Gail, well, would you like to start? We're talking, Gail can certainly relate to this. I'm sure you folks at Keeper can. Anyone that talks about death and dying, and it's a subject nobody wants to talk about. Um, every human being, every one of us, myself included, to varying degrees, is resistant to our own mortality, the fact that we're not going to live forever. So as somebody that's trying to get people to at least have one conversation about their final wishes. Um, how do you reach those people? You know, the internet. This 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 video cast, for example, is fabulous. But the people that are watching right now, the ones that are going to watch in the future, are sort of predisposed to dealing with the reality. But how do we reach and get through to all the zillions of other people who aren't searching, searching out this video or my website or Gail's information and book? How do you reach them? And I don't know that the, there is a single answer other than to just keep hammering away at it in, in a variety of mediums like this. Well, and I've found that humor and funny films is a great way to at least break down the resistance to end-of-life issues. And I have a license to use films in my talks. And I'll use comedies like Death at a Funeral or Undertaking Betty or Bernie to help illustrate things that people need to know. People don't know what they need to know when it comes to funeral planning. And uh, by having at least the idea of come to the funeral home and watch some movies, watch some film clips, um, I feel like getting people to a funeral home for something other than a funeral would help them loosen up about the whole topic. But it's it's really comes down to self-esteem. If you look at the terror management theory put forth by Dr. Ernest Becker in his book, The Denial of Death, our worldviews and how well we support those worldviews is what our self-esteem is all about. And if we don't have that kind of confidence in ourselves and our worldviews, we are going to pretend that we are not going to die and we're not going to make those arrangements to be prepared ahead of time. And there are studies that show that about one-third of the population has high self-esteem and the other two-thirds don't. And when you look at the percentage of people who actually pre-plan their funerals, who write wills, who do advanced directives, it's 25 to 30 percent, and I, it's my philosophy that it's that one third that has the high self-esteem to do it. So using humor and funny films, I'm hoping to break down that resistance and get people to know what they need to know. That's awesome. I think that's super important. And uh, yeah, thank you guys so much. Before we end, I want to give you both the opportunity to tell us what you're up to, what's happening next for you, is there anything we should check out of yours to sort of help continue this conversation? Absolutely. <laughs> I, I have a new ebook out which is available for free right now and I'm going to do a print version uh, that'll be a paid version later. Right now it's called Celebrating Life. How to Create Meaningful, Memorable Memorial Services with Templates and Tips. And uh, you can look for that on my website, also in the Light Earns. I co-authored it with uh, their CEO. But it's going to be issued as a print and uh, a paid e-book as Hail and Farewell, Cremation Ceremonies, Templates and Tips. And um, I do offer a free planning form that people can download at my website at goodbye.com. And I'm going out there speaking with uh, funny film clips and uh, speaking to a lot of different groups about end of life issues. And that's it's very encouraging the kind of reaction that I'm getting to that. Yeah, so Keeper actually did also a review of A Good Goodbye. Um, and we'll probably do a review of the ebook. So keep in touch with us, and we'll definitely be sharing Gail's new publications. Awesome. Chris, what about you? Well, I'll get around to writing a book someday, but uh, right now, <laughs> no. Um, um, I'm just going to continue writing. I, a lot of the ideas and articles I write about come directly from questions and ideas submitted to me by people who visit my website. So I encourage you, if you're watching, uh, this video, or live now, or in the future, um, to visit my website. 
dying.about.com, and you'll find my email address there under uh, my bio information. Shoot me a line. I'm always interested in hearing ideas and experiences because they always trigger great ideas. Wonderful. Well, that sounds great. So we'll definitely be more in touch with Chris and Gail. And uh, for those of you who are watching live or tuning in after, make sure to check out keeper.com slash blog and we'll be sending sort of a recap and even taking little snippets out um, so that we can sort of highlight different elements of it. And for those of you interested in becoming a panelist, feel free to email us at info at keeper.com and of course go to keeper.com to create a free online memorial for a loved one. So thank you, everybody, so much for tuning in. I'm Mandy. I'm Georgia. And uh, we'll see you at the next Top Death event. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>